why don't you um, talk a little bit about the first time you set foot in this room? Well, because nobody's alive to dispute it. I can't remember the first time I set foot in Israel. Uh, I know it was with my late wife, Faye. And we were married in 1950. Went back to college for a year, uh, came back home to Cleveland. And my guess is it would have been about 1955 would be my view of it. And um, the thing that I, I don't remember the when, but I remember what it meant to me to do it. And it comes about because when I was a young child, when I was 12 years old, uh, which would have been in 1939, um, from maybe 1937 until my grandparents passed away in 1940, um, when I would go to my grandmother's house, uh, the highlight was to have a piece of salami. Salami was located in the pantry off of the kitchen. And I would go in there with my grandma, who was very short, and uh, say, I built a piece of salami. I had kind of a slang Yiddish. And she'd say, Shane, fine. Uh, which one? And the which one referred to the three boxes that were on the wall. Uh, that hung below the salami. And the three boxes, the routine was started, which, what is this one? I, oh, this is the Alta home. And what is the Alta home? Oh, that's where people send their grandparents when they're older because they can be comfortable there, because they can have kosher food. But you would, you would never do that. You would take me into your house. That was easy enough to understand. The second one, bus is us. Oh, this is Mount Sinai Hospital. And for what do I need at Mount Sinai Hospital? When you become a doctor, it's a place that you can practice, and I can get kosher food. It's wonderful. And bus is us. Oh, this is Karen. How you saw it? This is for our homeland. So I'd say to my grandma, "What for? Why? What's a homeland? How? How many years?" has it been since we had a homeland? And she said, Spade toys in your 2,000 year. And I would say to my grandmother, that's silly. We haven't had a homeland in 2,000 years. And she said, mein Kind, you will live to see a homeland. So I remember not the year, but I remember the occasion when I set foot in Israel, literally put my foot down and said to my grandmother, I'm here. I arrived. And it's always been very hard for me to believe that in my lifetime this is something that that happened. What did it look like? What do you remember for what it looked like and what it felt like to be there? The answer to it was nothing much. When I say nothing much, it went through the years of the war uh, they hadn't started building a lot of new buildings or new housing. The amazing thing about Israel in the years that followed was everything was new. But when I was there, it was not a lot of construction going on. It was people coming in. Uh, there were hardships. Audrey mentioned to me that the first time she was there, she brought soap and she brought food and she brought other things. This was beyond that point. So it was a functioning country, but functioning at a very different level. And a piece of that, there are two pieces of that which are very interesting. Um, one of the pieces was that in the year of its founding, I had gotten out of the service in March of 1948. And uh, I worked at the Jewish Welfare 
uh, as a volunteer doing high school and college stuff. And it's where at a meeting that I was conducting with a bunch of kids, I met Faye who became my first wife. But um, I was in the office at my dad's lumber yard when he, uh, a gentleman came in to see him and said, we're starting a government in Israel and we need money, is it possible for you to uh, loan us some money? And I said, well, how much money would you like? I mean, this sounds crazy. I'd like $25,000. So my father went to the bank and gave him, gave him the money, and he gave him a check back from the government of Israel, uh, gave him a note from the government of Israel for $25,000 with it was 3%, whatever the interest was. They formed the state. 24 hours later, comes back a check from the government of Israel for $25,000 and some interest. And the interest could have been pennies. So I take the check and I give it to my father. And my father says, I won't accept it. I don't want Israel to pay me any interest. So I say, fine. Guy's name, I think, was Rosenbluth. So I slung it back to Rosenbluth, and I say, uh, here's the check. My father won't accept Israel. Rosenbluth runs a, writes a letter back and says, we're a government now. We pay interest. So it went on for about three months when I finally said to Rosenbluth, do me a favor. Would you please make the check into two checks? Give me one for the 25 and one for the interest, which he did. And I proceeded to take the check for the interest and tear it up, and I gave my father the $25,000 back, which he accepted. The recollection that I have of the founding of Israel was on a Friday night, I was on Mayfield Road uh, sitting in a car waiting to go into a meeting of a sorority, which is the way we collected money. We'd go into fraternity and sorority meetings and ask them to make a pledge and then they'd have a dance and collect it in some way. And I was sitting there and I was listening to Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver give his speech as to why Israel should be taken into the United Nations. And I heard the vote take place. I walked into the room. And I said to the girls, Israel is being accepted as a state. I have no idea what it means, but I think it's really important. So that was really a part of what took place. Earlier on, I had been with my father Myself and nine other people in 44 in the offices of Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of Treasury for FDR, when he told the group that they had good reason to believe that Jews were being killed in camps. That was actually the first time we, we had known that there were some people that were being killed, but we we had no idea that it was systematic or or the way it was uh, being done. But um, when I was 14 years old and I was in uh, junior high school, I started my first campaigning. So when I was 14 years old, it was 1941. And all the kids who are now my age, 90 years old, <laughs> walk up to him and say, I gave you my first pledge. So it's a very long uh, historical thing. And we, we knew so many of the people. Um, Golda Meyerson, not my year. Uh, Moshe Shertak, not Moshe Sheret. But they were all people that came to the house in the early years. Uh, visit with with my parents 
and then we got to see them when we were kids, and then when I would go there, uh, we would we would get to see them. So I had a really a personal relationship with a lot of the early people. I remember when I was a kid, not a kid, I was uh, out of the service, and uh, Chaim Weitzman was at the Waldorf Astoria, and I remember it because on the menu, the steak was Prince Henry the Fourth, and I couldn't understand how do you have a steak named Prince Henry the Fourth, but that was what we had, and I remember uh, because of my parents, I was the one that walked up to Chaim Weitzman and handed him a check for a million dollars, uh, which was we would collect money, and this was one of the things we did to uh, to help Israel along. So I lived through the uh, uh, the Rabat when people were living in shanties. Uh, we made a number of investments in Israel. I jokingly said, uh, let me give the money. That way I know I've lost it rather than investing it and losing it because early on, it was not a, a system, it wasn't a government, so you'd invest in pecans, and the pecans didn't come, you'd invest in this, and this didn't happen. You did a spinning meal and carry it got, but it wasn't old enough to to work well. But we knew all these fellas, uh, Dolchin, uh, I argued with Begin, uh, actually in the White House, because he thought all the Jews should be going to Israel. And I said, listen, my father didn't go to Israel. He came to the United States, and you should go where they they wanted to go. So it's been, uh, it's it's interesting because my lifetime was being born, the Depression, the war, the Holocaust, and the State of Israel. Nothing that happened after really changed any of the thoughts that I had at all. That was my whole life. It's what occurred in my life, and it's how I spent the, the time of my life. Albert, when you went to Israel the first or second time, what was the, um, the purpose of the trip? Was it just a sightsee, or was there a purpose to the trip? Yeah. Well, the, the purpose of the trip, what people have to understand, my, my great-grandfather and his uh, speech in, I think, was 18... 73 around that period of time pointed out that when you're leaving something the question is what you're leaving or where you're going to so in those day those days the overwhelming thought of going to Israel was like leaving um leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land. So what was the leaving of Egypt was the Holocaust had such an effect on the Jewish community because the people who were killed were everybody's relatives. So the tragedy came and an event happened, the State of Israel formed. But it wasn't when the State of Israel was formed you were going there because you had a homeland, you were going there because there were survivors of camps that were coming to Israel, that were coming from around the world. And the predominance was how do we settle these people? How do we take care of these people? It wasn't like they were hotels that nobody had built anything. So, so you were there to learn more, to learn uh, their experiences. So you were running from something to something. But you were running to didn't materialize. It materialized in the sense that it was a homeland. But that's all there, that's all there was. It was a homeland, but you had people that were coming off of boats. And they were hurt people, and they were sick people, and you didn't have the kinds of institutions that you had today, and you didn't fly into that airport, and you weren't an important guest that they put you in a car, and they showed you this, and they showed you that. 
So it was, uh, it was, it was like a lifetime. It was like being born, and then seeing these these things happen. Of the things that happened to me, I would guess was we had scheduled a trip. I think it was the year my son Brian was by mitzvah. Um, and it was the Seven Day War. And we took off uh, and couldn't go to Israel at the time of the Seven Day War. So we went uh, to Greece. No, we went to Turkey. We went to Turkey. And my father called. It was a day, about the fourth day of the war, and said, I'm flying into Israel on the fifth day. Meet me. So we were able to get a plane because things had quieted down, and we flew in. And that was an experience like no other because the war was, in a sense, still going on, but it was over. And among the things that we did was we went to the tombs of our patriarchs in a part of the world where Jews hadn't been for maybe 700 years. I remember like yesterday, my father, Faye, my daughter, Debbie, my son, Brian, and I held hands. And we walked up to the steps of the tombs, understanding that no Jew had done that for a long, long time. On the way home, we passed Rachel's tomb, and it was closed. And our driver said, you can't go in and visit because there's an Orthodox group that's praying. And my late wife said, eh, that's their problem. So we got out of the car and we went into Rachel's tomb, which was a mess. But I say to Mendy Klein, who's rebuilding it, listen, I saw it before you saw it because nobody could go in to see that as well. So uh, it, it's a lifetime and the connection um, the connection is interesting because the for those of us who lived during that time, you think of a homeland. So I think of the United States as a homeland, but I don't relate it to the fact that British English people came here because they were persecuted, partly because it was so far away partly because I'm not English, but the truth of the matter, it's why I'm here. On the other hand, when you say the word homeland and you're Jewish, it's the only place to go. It was then and it is now. How you keep that alive, how you get to the younger generation. Uh, there was just this survey made about after this period of time, 40% uh, of the country, I think less than 2 million Jews died. 40% uh, of the company don't know what Auschwitz is, is a problem. But if you lived it, it, it had special meaning. It really meant that had it not happened, we would have lost a whole bunch of more people. So, when I say it, I smile. But when I say it, I also understand that we didn't have it for a long time. And when I look at Jewish history and I total up the number of years that we have had a homeland, it's such a small number of years. I just hope that we appreciate what we have. Well, with people like you sharing your story that gave me chills about every other word you said, um, they have to hear what you have to say because they yeah. have to appreciate it. May I ask you one more question sure. about that? When, um, when you came back after having been in Israel the first or second time, um, I'm going to imagine that you must have talked to friends, colleagues, and encouraged them to go as well. Sure. What? Um, how did you, and were you able to convince people to go, and how did you convince them? Well, the issue, um, the issue as to w when you came back, you would 
clearly encourage people to go. And you had much different safety issues than you did now because you have to remember that you had the war. And people, and Israel was in danger uh, for long periods of time during that period of time. So the first question about going, is it safe to go? And the missions that you had very early were really among the largest givers and the organizers of the kinds of things that would ensure we could have a state. The concentration wasn't on the state. The concentration was how do you get people out and how do you get people in and where do you put them? So when you got to the point that you had missions and people would come back and tell other people, it was very meaningful. But the purpose, real purpose in going was to see for yourself and then tell people. But what you have to remember was the same time this was taking place in Israel, what was taking place in this country were that the survivors were coming to America. And when they came to America, they wouldn't tell their story. So the survivors came. In our lumberyard, we had a tremendous number of survivors who worked on loading boxcars, from boxcars there to boxcars here. And I was a kid, and I would talk to them. And they would say, I was in Auschwitz. Well, what was it like? I was in Auschwitz. And they wouldn't talk. But you had this tremendous inpouring of people coming to the United States at the same time you had them going to Israel. So I don't think, in a sense, we appreciated Israel in the same way we do now because we were so immersed. Uh, my Uncle Harry and Ann Miller would meet every train. My Aunt Ann, Harry's wife, would meet every train that came in and took them themselves to the apartment to make sure there was food and there was a mattress. So I had that going on in this country, which everybody was engaged in because it was a very large number of people and they were related to people and they came and then their people came. And then at the same time, you had this happening in Israel. Well, you didn't know the Israeli survivors. Most of the people met when I was in Israel early on were the people who came from Europe many decades before. They were the early pioneers in Israel. But the people I met in the United States were the people who were fresh from the camps. And one of the things I did when I got out of the army, when I came here, I started going around the country with survivors and going to Federation meetings, and I would accompany them. And the obvious happened, which is, why did I survive and why didn't they? Because when you heard their story, somebody would say, I'm, I'm not Jewish, what are they doing to me? I'm not Jewish. Why did they kill my family? So it was being played really the same thing in two different places. And the giving was so different. Um, I remember, you had to remember, we just we came out of the Depression when the war started. There was not a lot of money. Um, I think it was 1948. That was a year when five or six people may have given $25,000 each to the Federation. In the Depression, 1939 or so, the largest gift to the Federation was $5,000. So all of this, you had all of this happening here and you had all of the things on the side. So you had all of these people, a lot of them who were immigrants like my dad that came in the 20s, they didn't have a lot of money, but they had tremendous ideas. What I say now is we have tremendous money, but we don't have a lot of ideas. And you can appreciate how much more ideas really mean than money, just the way it worked. But you had living then people 
you know, they were going into Bialystok during the war. My dad would say a path at night when Poland was invaded. They took this city, they took that city. You know, it's like saying they took Akron, they took Toledo, but he lived in the programs that he had. So for us that were growing up with immigrant parents, it was a very vital, long period of time in which it was, uh, you were living every day a drama, and every day something would happen. And then you would get people who came here uh, from Israel, who had been in Palestine earlier, or some of them were survivors. And then what happened over time, when you went there originally, there was nothing, there was no building you could relate to because everything was the British. What I found about the British, which was interesting, they used British standards, so all the floors were tile, because the way of keeping the company broke. So they wanted very expensive buildings. So you go there, they're old buildings, there's tile on every floor, but there's nothing new. So over time, well, you, they, you had a dormitory at Hebrew University, you did this at the Hebrew uh, museum. So it changed. There was an Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah, I mean, they may have had an orchestra then, but you didn't go to the orchestra when you went there, and you brought stuff when you went there, and you gave it to them when you went there, and then you would invite them to come here. So um, it's, it's really been something that when you realize how many Jews have lived the life that I've lived or that my generation has lived. Uh, we say in our country that that generation, the generation I just missed, because I got in the army after the war, was the greatest generation. The generation of Israeli leaders at that time were remarkable. And you got to meet them all. I got to meet Ben Gurion, I got to meet, meet Dayan, uh, Sapir, Eshkel. Um, interestingly enough, I was back in Israel with my uh, family, with Rabin a month before uh, he was killed. And we were sitting and talking, we were talking about what was taking place in Israel. And he said to me when we were there that um, he just had had, I think it was a hundredth no confidence vote, whatever it is. And he said, the hatred in Israel is so bad that something is going to happen to somebody. And a month later it did. So, um, in many ways, I would say the country has filled its commitment. In some ways, the same kinds of things have happened to Israel that have happened to the United States. I keep reminding uh, people that the Second Temple failed because of uh, battles, internal battles. And you look at both countries at this point, and you see a lot of tribalism, and uh, it's been interesting. But despite everything else, despite when you think about it, we, we sit in Cleveland. I remember my son went to see Fiddler in the Roof uh, in Tel Aviv with somebody, and he was late coming home, and I was sitting with my father in the Hilton Hotel in Tel Aviv. My father says, I'm worried about him. I said, let's worry about him in Cleveland. In Israel, he's fine. So we sit in our neighborhoods, we say, you know, we have this terrible thing going on. I'm worried if I go downtown, if I do this, if I do that. And then I look today and I look at what's happening in Gaza and on the borders with the Arabs. They live under the under constant threat. And uh, the, the last thing I'll tell you is that uh, I have not been back to Israel since 19, I think it's 96 or 97. 
two days before we were leaving Israel, uh, I went to Yad Vashem and uh, happened to stand in front of an exhibit about the Germans and about Germany and Berlin and about a fact that the Germans had their best Jewish community when Hitler rose to power and they were put in the ghetto. And they formed all these schools and everything. Next day, I walked the walls of the old city on top of the ramparts. And I went into a shop and I wasn't feeling well. And we left Israel. My daughter flew on to Washington. And Audrey and I, we parted in Rome. We went to Positano in Italy. And I ended up with a heart attack. And as a result, I haven't been back because my wife is uncomfortable with me being too far from the Cleveland Clinic. And I remember when I was in the ambulance, I knew I'd had a heart attack, but I didn't know just how serious, I, I knew it was serious, but I didn't know what was gonna happen. I was sitting and thinking, I hope the same thing doesn't happen to the United States and Cleveland happened to Berlin, which was that the best time would ever have a great Jewish community, which we still have, thank God, was when something happened. So I've never been convinced it couldn't happen. On the other hand, there has never been a day of my life that I've ever, ever had any conflict with being a American who is Jewish loves Israel. It all just fits perfectly for me. It's all what my life is. Being such a proud Clevelander, but also being such a strong advocate for Israel, what is that knowing that you and your family are Clevelanders, but also have a love for Israel and, and, and starting that that life in Israel for people who can start a community? It doesn't exist. In other words, it's just what your life is. So you don't think about these things. You don't sit and say, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm from Cleveland. And they have a state in Israel. And you know, that's really a good thing. I really ought to be a part of it. It starts out with your mother and your father and your grandmother and your grandfather and your aunts and your uncles. And it's what you do. Uh, it's almost if you're, well, I used to play basketball. And when you have to think about what you're doing, you're lost. You just have to play. So, I mean, I have the same kind of feeling about the African American Museum, for example. To me, it's about liberty, it's about freedom. It's about knowledge, it's about helping one another, it's about helping repairing the world. But I never really think about anything that we have done other than what we should have done, and most times we don't do what we should have done. So I don't think in those terms. You wake up in the morning, you do the things you ought to do, you come home at night and you say to yourself, what did I really do today? And my belief is, my belief is that if you take the time to think about what you're doing, you've wasted the time to do it. So this is, this. I think, what, how have you survived? They haven't survived by sitting and saying, I've survived, I'm going to survive. They've survived by doing the things you needed to do to make sure that you did. And that to me is what life is. It's waking up every day and trying to do the things you do. And uh, people keep asking me, well, what's your legacy? And I don't understand what a legacy is. What I believe is, because this is what happened to my life, is that as long as I remember the people who affected my life, they're always here. And my hope would be that someday, when I'm not here, that people remember that I was here. And when they don't remember that I was here, the people who remembered I was here, that were remembered by other people, 
will remember. So I didn't. I never knew my great grandfather, who was a very famous rabbi. But here it is on Passover this year. I'm reading from his speech about are you looking, are you running away from something or are you running to something? So I think what it is is just continuity. So what you are, you're a very small piece of what is a very small people that have a very large connection. And that's I would say to my grandma, I have to, how do you remember for 2,000 years you couldn't have something, you could have it? It's who we are. So that's, it's, it's what it is. It, Mayor Jackson has a saying, it is what it is. So I happened to be with him today, and we were having a discussion, well, what does that mean? Is it, it is what it is. And what it is, what it is means to at least he and myself, is the fact that what we're saying is things are where they are and what do we do next. But if you don't understand where you are, you never know what you can do best. So what you try to do is you try to just assess and, and you do things and you do things that your relatives probably did 500 years ago. But you don't know them, they don't know you. But but it works. The most important quality a leader can have is humility. See, so what do you mean humility? You, you go to leadership classes and you make contacts and you have a Rolodex. What do you mean humility? And what Bob Galvin used to say was, if you're humble, you'll listen to what other people say and you'll learn. And if you're not, you're not going to learn anything. So life, life is learning. And the only way you can learn is to understand Eisenhower. Interesting, I've had a horrible temper, terrible. And they did things to try to get him to lose it. And eventually he got to the Panama Canal and he met a general who helped him do it. But he had a poem, and I think it was a poem his mother gave him, and the poem said in effect, you take a pail and you fill it with water. You take a glass, you take a glass of water out. You look at the pail. The hole that's left in the water in the pail is how much you'll be missed. Nada. <laughs> okay, so I have no illusions, all right? I have no illusions. You're privileged to be here, and you do the best you can.